So um, I've been asked to talk today about how IT should be organised and governed. Um, I've been working in the technology sector for about 20 years, the companies ranging from tiny startups to um, global brands. And for about the last 10 years, I've been an independent consultant. Um, I've been lucky enough to work on some life-changing products. Uh, some were life-changing for me, uh, some life-changing for other people, and also worked on some absolute total nightmares as well. Um, when people ask me what I do these days, I actually find it quite hard to define. I used to call myself a digital media consultant, but um, what does digital media even mean anymore? But at what point do we stop talking about digital and information technology as something different, and it start being something that everyone just does? And I think this highlights a big problem with technology and technologists, that people like to give us labels to put IT in a box. Um, and that's why the focus of my talk today is going to be unleashing IT. We are working in a space that has very blurred boundaries, a space where creativity meets technology, IT for arts. It's a space where things are constantly evolving, a space where the things we're doing and the ways we're working can be difficult to pin down. Now, we can't have no barriers and no rules, but putting technology on too tight a leash is, I think, often the point where things start to go wrong. I believe we need to challenge the idea of technical support, of technology always playing a supporting role. Because as technologists, we shape the tools that are changing the world. As IT professionals, we can shape conversations about how new ideas can be delivered, and not just conversations about IT itself, but about everything. We have the skills to do this. IT technology is so often seen as just an enabler, something that's tacked on at the end. For me, unleashing IT means allowing the freedom for technology to become part of the creative process, to put technology at the core of what we do. So, to give you some background to where I'm coming at this from, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a director of a consultancy firm called ThoughtSmith. We work with public institutions and charities to develop digital creative and business strategy and work mainly in the areas of arts, culture and education, which is how I come to be here today. Um, we advise national bodies like uh, big ones like the Arts Council, smaller organisations like the Arts Marketing Association. We work with venues, again, big ones like the Lowry, smaller galleries like the Towner, um, and often in that space where arts and science uh, collide, so for the Science Gallery in Dublin and the Wellcome Trust. Um, in my previous roles, I was at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, where I was running projects for its Culture Online programme. And my last full-time staff job was as head of online for the Houses of Parliament, um, managing a team of producers, designers and developers trying to make uh, Parliament more understandable to the outside world. Um, most recently I've been working with the BBC, helping them manage new ways to engage the independent digital production sector. Uh, and I've just finished a big report for the British Library advising them on what the future of radio might be as they're about to embark on building a new national radio archive. So, I've talked a little bit about me. Um, let's talk a little bit about you. I've met some of you before. Um, I'm fortunate I couldn't be here earlier today, but I noticed it's quite a mixed crowd. Um, some of you doing more technical IT roles, I think. Is that true? And some of you um, more editorial digital media roles. Um, some of you from well-resourced larger organisations, others from much smaller organisations. Um, so, um, I just thought it would be important to stress, given this variety, I think it's um, many problems we face, I believe, from having had the opportunity to work with a whole range of different companies are the same for small projects as they are for large ones, and also for small organisations as they are for large ones. So what I'll aim to do in the next half hour is to highlight what I see as some of the common ground, to find some common truths that will hopefully chime with you, and talk about some of the things that are essential to making IT and digital projects work. So, um, a quick overview of how the rest of this talk will pan out. We've introduced ourselves, um, we've established there's like to be some common ground. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about where we're working in this space that we're working in, this space where IT meets arts. And then I'll use most of my time setting out what I think are some common rules for organising and governing the work that we do. So let's start by trying to understand a bit more of this, uh, this space where arts and IT collide. Um, and let's think about arts. And I'd like to set the context with um, a couple of quotes. Um, does anyone know who said this? Without tradition, art is a flock of sheep without a shepherd. Without innovation, it is a corpse. Does anyone know It's a good one, isn't it? 
era, roughly, this year, last year, 100 years ago. So that was Winston Churchill um, talking to the Royal Academy of Arts in 1953. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense when you think about the definition of art. Art is the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination. So art, innovation, technology, they're all inextricably linked. Without technology, without innovation, there would not be art. Another quote. Does anyone know who said this? The art challenges the technology and the technology inspires the art. And that was uh, John Lasseter, who is the animation film director, the director of Toy Story, Bugs Life, Cars, chief creative officer of Pixar, Walt Disney. His, his um, CV is very big. Someone who's totally moved the boundaries of art and technology. And lastly, while we're talking about innovation, just to reiterate an earlier point, innovation has nothing to do with how many R&D dollars you have. When Apple came up with the Mac, IBM was spending at least 100 times more on R&D. It's not about money, it's about the people you have, how you're led, and how much you get it. Can you guess who that is? It's a clue. Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs. You can't really talk about innovation without talking about Steve Jobs. So we're working in an artistic, creative space. It's all about innovation. Um, and we're also working with technology, the other side of this circle. Um, and technology, of course, is also all about innovation and changing very rapidly, as we know. Now, interestingly, many technology commentators are saying there is no such thing as a technology industry anymore. The technology is simply part of everything we do. Um, the Web Summit, which is happening in Lisbon next week, one of the biggest technology conferences in the world, has this on their homepage. There is no longer such a thing as a tech industry, just industries that have been affected by tech. Or, to put it the other way around, the era of tech companies is over. There are only companies steeped in technology that will survive. The term tech is used a lot to describe companies with a website and a mobile app, but that's pretty much every company these days. And this shift is demonstrated with organizations that I've worked with and how they're restructuring their IT departments. So BBC Technology has now been replaced with a design and engineering directorate, which has a much broader remit. And uh, Parliament IT department has been replaced by a um, parliamentary digital service, which again is responsible for communications as well as, uh, as, well as IT. So why does this matter? Well, as I said, we're working with space where everything is innovation. But because it's arts and technology, it can be double innovation at any one time. And at the same time, the boundaries of technology are beginning very blurred, which means many of the rules are being rewritten. So we want to establish how we organize and govern ourselves in this massive state of change. And what have we got that we can hold on to? So, uh, where are we? I'm going to approach this in the classic consulting manner with the five W's. Talk about who, what, where, when, and why. And then I'll try and finish on some more practical tips with how. So who? We start with people. Um, and a wise man once said this, technology is nothing. What's important is that you have faith in people. They're basically good and smart, and if you give them tools, they'll do wonderful things with them. That was Steve Jobs again. Um, so we're talking about some rather special people. Oh. Um, much like Steve Jobs, we are ideally talking about people who understand technology and creativity, people who themselves blur the boundaries I mentioned earlier. For digital projects to work, for IT projects to work, they really need to work for their audiences and for their users. And so the people who work on those projects, at least some of them, need to understand audiences. Now, technologists who understand audiences, I think, are particularly difficult to find, but they do exist. And I know there are a lot in this room today, and I've worked with a lot of them myself. But it's particularly important not to pigeonhole, not to say, you're a technologist, you're a creative, you have to separate. On the best projects, everyone has a say, so the IT person can freely share their view about the creative. And the reverse is also true. Just as you want technologists to get the arts, you ideally want creatives who get technology. And don't put all the technical expertise in the hand of one person. Say, right, technology, that's your responsibility. It's all your fault when it all goes wrong. So you've got your people. Ideally, there's a mixture of people. And then you need to think about teams. So how many people have got an org chart that looks like that? Is that yours, your org chart? Or is it a bit bigger than most of your org charts? 
Well, I think, um, from my experience, a digital team is a bit more like that. Um, people working together more collaboratively, engaging with each other to solve problems. Um, and so what might some of those roles be around the outside there? What sort of what jobs do you have in, a, in an IT team? Shout a few out. Box office manager, data manager, I yeah. mean, those kind of roles. Yeah, yeah, developer as well. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so I mentioned earlier how some of the best people will blur the boundaries between these different roles. Um, and that can lead to teams where roles are not so clearly defined. And this is why I think there's a crucial role in the middle of this circle, someone who binds everything together. Now, I appreciate for smaller organizations, this might not be a person you hire to do a particular job, but it's a, it's a role that you need to think about. And that person is a producer rather than a project manager, someone who bridges all the roles and has a credibility with each of those people to, to have a conversation. Now, all your organizations will take a slightly different approach to IT, to, to the way you do this. And, um, you know, the classic IT team, you'll have a user group or super users um, who you will call on to find out and to check that a project's meeting its goals. But in organizations like the BBC, there's this proxy audience member, this producer who sits in the middle, who's always there championing the user, calling for what they want. And this producer figure needs a range of skills. They need to talk about user interfaces with the designers, they need to talk about data with the developers, but most importantly, they have the end user in mind, and they push for a product or service that works on their behalf. I think that where a lot of projects fail, they don't have that person saying, well, hang on a minute, why are we doing this for these people here? What do they want out of this? So that covers the who. In terms of the what. Come on. monolithic systems. I'll put this in here as an example of something not to do. So when I started at, as head of online at Houses of Parliament, they were about six months into uh, a million pound project to replace each of the intranets managed by indiv individual departments with this one central content management system that was going to um, solve every problem. And I mean every single problem. It was, it was going to, any problem anyone had ever had was going to be solved with this content management system. It was going to be amazing. But unfortunately, whoever spec'd it out had failed to add some of the things that uh, uh, an HTML page created in Notepad could do. Um, and one of the, as an example of that, one of the key things was the catering department wanted to put uh, the menu of the day, the URL for the menu of the day on the menus so that people could type that in or remember it and type it in when they got back to their desks. But the CMS didn't do that, it just did huge um, machine generated gobbledygook URLs, about 256 characters long, a bit like a, the uh, Wi Fi password here, that sort of thing. Um, so we talked to the developer, bearing in mind this is a development company that had to quote it about a million pounds for doing this project, and they said it would cost an extra 50,000 to add the function for URLs that you could print out and put on a piece of paper. <laughs> so luckily that was a nail in the coffin for that project. We ripped up the check for a million pounds and we hired a web producer instead, and who we paid about 30,000 a year, and she solved the problem for us. And the problem was that no one was really coordinating anything. No one was talking to each other. No one had sat down and said, hang on a minute, how, why don't we just change it this way and do it that way? And it didn't need a million pounds. It just needed a little bit of common sense. So by contrast, modular systems um, touches on one of the points that's been raised, I think, in feedback that um, the members of this group have, have sent in before, which is how do you adapt in the light of changing technologies? And I think the answer is, you choose the best tools for each job, but ensure that on your list of criteria for selecting those tools, that interoperability is high up on the list, along with ease with which data can be exported and migrated. So when you're ready to try something new, you can swap one part of the system out for a different bit of a system. And that ties in with, um, with a more general theme of simplicity. What's the quickest and easiest way you can solve a problem? If you want to quiz your audience to find out what they think, but you're not certain people will engage, don't build a massive system. Write a tweet, see if anyone replies to it. If they don't, write a different tweet, see if anyone replies to that. Um, 
So are, are you familiar with the concept of minimum viable product? Have you all heard of that term? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just very briefly, that's the idea that when you develop something, you put in just enough features to, to learn whether it works or not. Um, and in other words, don't try everything at once. You build the bare minimum and put it out there to see if it works. Um, and that also fits with, with um, keeping your team, uh, keeping things manageable in your team. So whichever way you organize a team, if you keep your projects simple, you'll give the people working on them more breathing space, um, which is especially important with digital projects and innovation projects with lots of tech. When scientists run experiments, they don't change every single variable at once. They tweak a few little things and see what works. If you try too many things at the same time, it's much harder to work out. Um, much time, harder to work out um, where things have gone wrong. So another problem with IT teams is often physical presence. That the IT the IT department is made to sit somewhere else um, on the naughty step, sort of out of the way where no one can see them. At Parliament, this was a separate building down the road, not taking up the nicer office space that the MPs and Lords wanted, but also subsequently out of reach and a bit out of touch. Now, we can't always change things like physical location of our desks, but we can always stand up and move around. So, um, and I think you know, in places I've worked where there are technology experts on hand within shouting distance, it's been a huge advantage. So, at the BBC, um, where until recently I was setting up and running open innovation competitions to encourage better ways of working with indie agencies, the technologists sat at the same desk as everyone else, and it really helped. Um, and that's also very important for, um, for another reason, and that's that at the start of any new project, you really need to involve the technologists in the idea. Um, I was recently invited to run a workshop um, for a project that had stalled. It had been going on for several months and it wasn't really going anywhere. Um, there was an idea, it was an idea for an app to engage people in the science concept, um, but no one was quite clear what it should be or how it should work. Um, and the simple fact was that no one had put the creative people and the technical people in the same room at the same time. So as soon as they were put in the same room and asked the right questions, they came up with a plan. So what does this tell us? We should not leave creatives on their own to develop their ideas and then specify what they want to happen. The right approach is co-invention, inviting technologists to discuss and shape the solutions at the start. And in fact, it's not just technologists. You need designers, editors, people who understand the business drivers for the organization you're working in. Um, I was working on another project, I can't, I better not say who, because I'm going to film with this, where, where a television producer literally said, I don't see why I should have to come to a meeting with these people. Um, because he thought it was beneath him to engage with the technology. Um, which comes back to this thing, no clearer example really, that technology is not just there for support. Um, you're not going to come up with a brilliant creative idea if you don't get the people together in the same place. So on to the when. Um, and the key thing here is speed. As with any area of innovation where things are moving very quickly, it's important that we too move at a good pace, to build things quickly, test quickly and move on. So another project I was involved with was a four-year technical research project for which the partners had won funding. This was a few years ago now. But by the end of four years, everything had changed. The whole reason for having the project had evaporated. Um, it produced some really good things. The important bits that had been developed along the way were turned into W3C standards. The less important bits had been superseded by new technology. Um, but there was no reason to have that project for four years. It would have worked as a one-year project. It probably would have produced as many useful things. Um, an example from the other end of the spectrum, uh, at Thoughtsmith, I co-wrote a report for the Arts Council um, on how they should encourage digital engagement. Um, and we recommended that the Arts Council fund the Arts Marketing Association to set up a, a digital marketing academy, which we said should be lean, with rapid iteration, allowing innovative ideas to be tested cheaply with real audiences. Um, and they funded this, and it's now in its third year, and I think it's a really good example of, um, because it, it in itself is small and lean, and we're set up to see how quickly can we set this thing up and get it working. Um, and it's turned out to be very successful. So on to the why. Um, I'm going to skip through the slides now. 
No? Okay. Um, there is so much we could do in the world of digital IT, in digital and IT, and especially for smaller organisations with limited resources. It can be overwhelming when you consider where you should start. So it's useful to have criteria for working out what you should prioritise. And then each new project idea can be assessed against these. You can mark some of these as essential, things that every project must do, and others as desirable. Um, it's important overall to have a balanced portfolio of projects that you're not always just ticking the easiest boxes, that overall your projects tick every box. And I think criteria are really valuable um, for managing teams and also managing external suppliers because it's a very useful shorthand way of explaining what's important to you. So as an example, I mentioned uh, recent work with the BBC where we're setting up and running innovation competitions. We developed a clear set of criteria and published these openly, encouraging indie agencies to pitch. Um, so we were, we were very prescriptive about the criteria themselves, but not about what formats or approaches we wanted. Um, and we came up with some really unusual ideas, such as uh, you know, a, a unexpectedly paper uh, products to meet the brief that we thought was going to be about virtual reality. But they did meet the criteria and they were sort of interesting things to, to explore. So for a small organisation, I think um, one of the most important criteria is does this give us something that we might be able to reuse? So a specific example might be a quiz engine uh, built for a specific purpose but done in such a way that you can then reskin it multiple times for future projects. Um, I'm often asked about the pros and cons of Agile versus Waterfall. Do you all understand and know the differences between more or less? So, briefly speaking, just to skim over it for anyone who doesn't, Agile is a way of approaching a project which is all about evolutionary development. So, you work in cycles, adding a little bit at a time and working out what you're going to do as you go along, whereas the Waterfall approach is more of a sequential, non-iterative build one thing, build the next thing, which flows down looks like a waterfall. Um, but there's a really important point to note here, is that Agile does seem to be used sometimes as an excuse for a lack of project management rigor. Um, so if someone tells you what they're doing is new or different and can be, can't be managed in a normal way, and the only way we can do this is by starting with a completely blank piece of paper, your alarm bells should ring because there's not really any reason why a project, uh, even an agile, experimental, innovative digital project, <coughs> shouldn't have a plan. Because every project is, is a trade-off between cost, time, scope, um, and quality. So it's essential to pin some of these things down. And related to that, a question that comes up is, um, with Agile and Waterfall, is how, if you want an agile project, how do you go about writing a contract for that? Um, now, from my experience, the relationship you have with your supplier is always much more important than whatever contract you choose to write and whatever form you want that contract to take. But I've also never seen an Agile contract that really works. Um, I've worked on Agile projects that have worked very well, but they've always started with a fairly detailed plan that was later changed. So I don't think waterfall contracts stop you being Agile. I think it's better to have a plan and change the plan than have no plan at all. One way of having that shared vision is storyboarding, which is, I think, a very powerful way of ensuring everyone knows, uh, has, a, has an idea of what it is you're trying to do. And I don't mean a technical architecture diagram or a site map. Uh, I mean something more like uh, a cartoon that shows uh, the steps that people are going to take. Um, now, hand, it doesn't have to, have to be as well drawn as this one. This is a, a hand-drawn sketch that on a piece of paper is, is sometimes more valuable because people feel that they can be a little bit more critical of it. People think, oh, that's had a lot of work done on it, so you better not criticise. Um, but also there's a, a very powerful thing about putting the idea on a piece of paper and showing someone the piece of paper. Because then someone's criticising the piece of paper, they're not criticising the person who put forward the idea, and that, that makes for a much more open discussion. A key thing to note about this is that Often a user journey starts long before someone actually sits down at a website or gets the phone out of their pocket. And it's very important to capture some of those stages because they often lead to sort of surprising um, assumptions. 
And then the next stage, of course, prototypes. Um, very important to proving an idea is scalable, replicable, replicable and sustainable. Um, a really good example of this is the, is the BBC Taster platform. I don't know how many of you know that. It's well worth a look. It's bbc.co.uk slash taster. Um, because an organisation like the BBC, it would be almost impossible to get anything done. Partly because it's so huge, but also because you've got every time you do anything, the Daily Mail writes an article about how you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. So Taster allows the BBC to say, this is just an experiment. We're just trying something new here. It's not, this isn't, we're not going to keep this going forever. Um, but you don't need to be a large broadcaster to do that, and it doesn't have to be costly. Just it's really a case of clearly labelling your, your public experiments so that you can gauge reaction to new ideas. Um, I mentioned the Arts Marketing Association, the Digital Academy. When that was set up, I was asked to mentor some of the fellows. Um, and some of those were really small organisations, one person working on their own to try and develop uh, you know, the, the entire marketing plan and the website and all the social media. Um, and one venue wanted to create, had an idea for a new forum that they wanted to, to um, engage people around one of their events, um, which could have been very costly to set up, but once it was pared back down to the, to the bare bones, we realised it was something that could just be tested on Facebook um, to see whether people were interested in it before, any, before it was taken any further. So I think a, 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 I should say prototypes. Um, one of the biggest problems with prototypes is scope creep, and especially at the point that it looks like a project is started to be successful because um, because you, people look, see the success and they think, oh, well, can we just add this bit on and add that bit on? And I think that's a, that's a real danger. Um, and you should avoid growing things into a full service until you have support to do it, which leads on to um, planning ahead. What happens when the money runs out? And I can't tell you how many projects I've been asked to help with where no thought at all has been given to what happened once it's been built. Um, just, just a couple of weeks ago, I was working on another EU-funded project with uh, universities and the broadcasters collaborating together to build um, some serious IT infrastructure. And everyone's very excited about what it's going to do. But I asked who was going to keep it going once it was delivered, and no one had the answer to that question. So the first time one of the underlying components of that huge system needs to be patched or replaced, the whole thing will stop working, um, which is clearly something we're going to have to fix before it does. And finally, Iteration. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. We're working in a space where um, we work in a space where there's so much is new and experimental, where new artistic expression meets new technology platforms. So I think, however, IT and digital teams are structured and governed, because sometimes appreciate you don't can't change everything. It must be recognised that mistakes will be made, and mistakes should be made. We need to all push for the freedom to experiment, to be playful, and to try new approaches, and to not always get things right first time. So as I said, I know we can't always change the things we've talked about here, but I think some of them we can. Um, and it would be great to open this up to a discussion to say, well, what, you know, what things are impossible to change? But I think you know, when you get back to the office tomorrow, maybe, maybe move your chair or uh, sit somewhere else for the day, or possibly invite yourself along to that creative meeting that you've always wondered you know, what goes on in that room. Or um, I think the key one is think about who is that person in the team. Maybe it's you because you do everything, or maybe it's some role that hasn't been identified. Who is that person who really thinks about what the user wants and, and puts their hand up and says, hang on a minute, that's what we need for this person. So um, that's it. I'd love to know your thoughts. Thank you very much for listening.